Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional materials available on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an anonymous chat session, allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. All of the efforts of Telema Press, including this lecture, are made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Help us to help humanity by making a donation. Telema Press is a non-profit corporation. Donations are tax deductible. For more information, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Welcome. I'm happy to invite you and welcome you to our, the beginning of our course about Gnostic, Gnostic astrology. To begin, it's always helpful to understand the context of our studies. As you know, We'll be discussing the science of gnosis. And as many of you know, this term gnosis is Greek and refers to knowledge. And it's the root of many words that we use in common everyday language, such as diagnosis. So the term gnosis doesn't refer to a simple intellectual form of knowledge or any kind of cultural or traditional inherited knowledge. But instead it refers to a perceptible experiential form of knowledge. Something that is individual. Something that is unique. Real gnosis is not theoretical. It's one's own experience. It's one's own reality. It's the truth. We all have gnosis to some level, to some degree, because we have some degree of consciousness. And in truth, gnosis is a science of consciousness. To understand what gnosis is, we must recognize what the consciousness is. And to work with the science of gnosis is to work with one's own consciousness. From another point of view, we can say there are two doctrines which exist in the world. The doctrine of the I and the doctrine of the heart. The doctrine of the I related to the physical eye, is that collection of theories, collection of ideas, it's all the beliefs and traditions, all of the varying interpretations of spiritual knowledge. And as you know, as an investigator of spirituality, the theories are as varied as the human beings themselves. 
And one theory will contradict another. And it's difficult to find any real truth. But in the doctrine of the heart, we find the experiential knowledge, the doctrine of gnosis, the doctrine that one grasps through one's own effort. This type of doctrine, the doctrine of the heart, is not a cultural doctrine. It's not found in a book. It's not found in any school, nor in any religion. The doctrine of the heart exists within yourself, within your own heart. Residing in the depths of your own heart is a spiritual flame, a spark which in Western traditions is called the Adam Noose, spelled N-O-U-S. And it's called an atom because of its relative size, not because it is a physical atom. The Adam Noose is a sort of architect, a kind of intelligence, which resides within the heart of every humanoid. And it's from this atom within the heart that the heart doctrine can be discovered and learned. So when we approach the study of Gnosis, we have to bear in mind that if we limit ourselves to merely a theoretical analysis, we will never grasp it. We will never find it. We will find only complication and contradiction because theories always contradict other theories and in this physical formation that people call gnosis there are contradictions but those contradictions are a matter of appearances they are a matter that has to be comprehended and the reason behind that is the heart doctrine or true gnosis is individualized as the Christ becomes individualized, as the Christos, as that divine intelligence becomes individualized. And in that individualization, the knowledge applies to the level of that aspirant, of that initiate. What is appropriate and good for an aspirant or an initiate at a certain level has to be abandoned by one at a higher level. Therefore, the one who limits his study to the intellect will perceive two contradictory instructions which apply to two different levels and they will enter into conflict. The synthesis or the the answer to that is to discover gnosis inside of oneself, for oneself. In that sense, we follow exactly after what the Buddha himself taught, which says, you must test my words You have to live them. You have to apply them. Otherwise, they have no purpose. We can say that gnosis, this doctrine of the heart, is directed towards the expansion of our self-knowledge. To know oneself is to gather Gnosis of the truth of life and death, of reality. This is not something to be taken lightly. The fact is that death awaits every one of us. None of us know when the moment of our death will arrive. It could be today, it could be in the next matter of hours. And that comprehension, that recognition is important because it provides a foundation for us to manage our attention, to manage our will, to not be distracted. Some traditions in the West have this phrase, memento mori, remember death. 
The purpose behind that is to always be mindful of the present moment. And when we are mindful and present and observant of ourselves, we are standing in the door of Gnosis. Gnosis, as a science, as an art, does not exist in the past. It does not exist in the future. The only way to enter into and access gnosis or knowledge is in the present moment. And to do that, to acquire that, requires discipline. It requires effort. But most of all, it requires consciousness. To be conscious, to be attentive, to be aware. This refers to one of the foundational teachings in this doctrine of the heart, which says that there are two lines that exist in life. There's the horizontal line, which moves from birth through all the experiences that we can have in life to death. That line moves steadily in accordance with our karma, in accordance with our values, positive and negative, which are within us. Most of humanity remains on this line in ignorance, in confusion, in darkness. And this is because there are, in truth, four levels, roughly speaking, to the capacities of human consciousness. If you can imagine a building which has four floors. Most human beings, what we call human beings, live the entirety of their time within a physical body on the bottom two floors and have no idea about the other two. The first level, the bottommost level, is what we commonly call sleep. But in this case, we would say this really refers to the sleep of the physical body. And this state is when we need to rest and we lie down, the physical body goes to sleep, and the consciousness leaves the physical body and we begin to dream. In our own experience, as an individual person, as one humanoid entity, what is our own experience of dreaming? This is a key factor of great importance in your life because it indicates your own conscious capacities. Most people don't even remember their dreams. Or if they do, the dreams are very vague, sporadic. And the ones they remember, obscure, incoherent. And this is because the consciousness is weak, is conditioned, is trapped. The second state of consciousness is what we call the vigil state. And it's when our physical body is active, moving around, doing things. But according to the heart doctrine, according to Gnosis, this is really just another level of sleep. And all the great masters and prophets and teachers have said so. Jesus repeatedly emphasized that we are asleep. So did Buddha. So did Moses. So did Quetzalcoatl. All these great teachers pointing out to us that our consciousness is asleep. We think we're awake. And this is the problem. We believe that we are awake because we are perceiving and acting. And we think that is equivalent to being awake. But it's not. 
an awakened consciousness is something distinct, it's something different. The consciousness itself is the ability to perceive. It is perception. But it's not perception limited by the five senses. The consciousness can perceive more than merely the physical dimension, which is what we correspond to this second level of consciousness. Many people have experiences of becoming very conscious and very awake in a dream when the physical body is asleep. This is so commonplace that it cannot be ignored. And it, in fact, indicates precisely that the consciousness is not dependent upon the physical body. It is a separate entity. It is an entity which inhabits the physical body when it's necessary to do so. And when the physical body is discarded, either at night when we sleep or at death, the great sleep, the consciousness moves to some other vehicle in order to operate. There are many vehicles that the consciousness can utilize, and it can act without vehicles of any kind if it's trained. When we're dreaming, the consciousness is inhabiting what people call the astral body. But in fact, it is a protoplasmatic lunar body whose very particles belong to nature and whose very core essence is karma. It is, in fact, the ego. That's why our dreams commonly, typically, are mere manifestations of desire, whether craving or aversion, whether desires of craving things or desires to avoid things. Most dreams manifest from this fundamental pendulum of craving and aversion. But the consciousness itself can be trained to be awake while the physical body sleeps. This, some people call this lucid dreaming or out-of-body experiences. In the East, they call it dream yoga, which is one of the four yogas that Naropa taught. This science of dream yoga is an integral part of the heart doctrine of Gnosis because it is concerned directly with awakening the consciousness in the first level when the physical body is sleeping. But we also have to awaken the consciousness in the second level when the physical body is active. We commonly call this mindfulness, watchfulness, attentiveness, we have practices of meditation, whether walking or sitting, practices of concentration, japa, many different types of techniques, the use of mantra, all of which exist in order to assist us as we train our attention. The training has as its purpose the development of the consciousness, the ability of the individual to maintain continuous consciousness. The difficulty is we feel we are already conscious. Why would someone try to get something they already think they have? This is the problem. In truth, in the same way that the stars are not visible during the day, dreams are still there. We just don't see them. But when we learn how to observe, to start the process, to learn the science of self-observation, to be present from moment to moment, to remain watchful of everything that is arising and passing within our own psyche. We can begin to see the shocking truth of the dreaming mind. That this mind that we have 
continues dreaming all day long. Obviously, we have daydreaming, which everyone's familiar with. But dreaming is something that's happening all the time, below our awareness. We say in Gnosis that our consciousness extends only to a very small part of who we really are. And the purpose that we have is to expand that, to extend that, to become more conscious of ourselves, to know more about why we suffer. Why do we suffer? Why are there so many problems? Elves suffer so much. Why do we make others suffer so much? Because of ignorance. Because of craving. Because of aversion. These three aspects, these three factors, are symbolized in the very center of the Bhava Chakra, the wheel of samsara. You see there a pig, a rooster, and a snake. These three symbolize three destructive factors that unify to keep us trapped in this wheel of suffering. Ignorance, craving, and aversion. So gnosis is the method, the science, to train the consciousness to begin to perceive the causes of suffering which are within. And in that way, to begin to conquer them. Consciousness in itself is light. Wherever you find light, you find consciousness. To the great astonishment of modern scientists, they are proving this. If you've done any investigation into quantum mechanics, modern physics, you'll know what I'm referring to. Scientists are amazed to discover consciousness is more than what we thought it was. And in in Gnosis, universal Gnosticism, it has long been taught, just as the Buddha taught, that every atom in nature has consciousness. Every atom is a combination of three factors, energy, matter, and consciousness. This is why scientists have been unable to create atoms because they can't manipulate the conscious aspect. They can manipulate matter, but that's it. And that's because the management of the consciousness belongs to the one who has consciousness developed. In other words, what our ancient forefathers called the gods The gods were human beings. Human beings who developed themselves and became perfect. Like Jesus, like Buddha. We call them gods because they have powers that the terrestrial human can't even conceive of, but which lay dormant, nestled within our very atoms, within our very structure. And the existence of all of our spiritual traditions are there, to indicate and point the way for each person to develop that on their own inside. In other words, we seek light to become a transmitter of light, to emit light. But light is consciousness, perception, reality, This is not a theory. This is not an idea. This is palpable. This is something you have to taste. You have to experience. You have to create the causes which produce the effects. Believing in it will not help you. Rejecting it will not help you. One has to experiment to work. To awaken the consciousness is to accumulate light. 
to begin to see new things. The doorway to that is the third state of consciousness. The third state is what we call self-remembering. But the self is the real self. The being, the one who is our own spirit, our own father, our own God, our own divine mother. The divinity which rests within us and has given us existence itself, but whom we have forgotten. The third state of consciousness is active from moment to moment. If your consciousness is passive, you are asleep. To be active means to be under the active guidance of attentive will. That is, you are consciously choosing what you perceive and how you perceive it. This does not require thought. It does not require belief. It has nothing to do with theory. It is an activity, an action, which has to be provoked, produced by will from moment to moment. And this is why spiritual aspirants learn concentration practices, how to follow a mantra, how to visualize how to imagine. These are training exercises. They are preliminary exercises which develop the capacity to remain in the third state of consciousness. Meditation is the most potent tool for the development of the third state of of consciousness. But by meditation, I'm not referring to these preliminary concentration practices. I'm referring to pratyahara to dhyana, to dharana, to samadhi, to the levels of perception which exist beyond mere concentration. Concentration is the beginning. Meditation is the door itself. In that state of observation, one comes to recognize that the consciousness exists separate from the intellect. It is separate from feelings. It is separate from sensations. These three realms are what we call the three brains. Which exist within every intellectual humanoid. The three brains are the intellect, related to thoughts and ideas and theories. The emotional center, the emotional brain, related to feelings, whether good or bad, liking and disliking to the motor instinctive sexual brain, which is related to sensation, to instinct, and to the functionalism of the sexual energy. These three brains are all transmitters and and, uh, processes of energy, each one having its distinct purpose and function. The consciousness is separate from those three. But in us, it's weak. And the consciousness is tossed about in this mess of craving and aversion as our dreams, as our desires, process through our three brains all night long and all day long. With the end result that the energy, the light, is processed through our three brains in a harmful way. In other words, we're victims of our own mind. We have pride within We have anger, we have lust, we have fear, we have envy, gluttony, laziness. Many defects, many problems, many mistakes. So many, in fact, that in the Gospels they are called the Legion. In the Egyptian mysteries they are called the Red Demons. They are a multitude. They don't exist outside of us, they are inside. And they trap the consciousness itself. By learning how to access and sustain the third state of consciousness, this profound, active, attentive state, we can begin to perceive those dreams, 
those desires as they arise. We begin to perceive, oh, here comes this resentment against my friend, which wants me to be critical and sarcastic and get revenge on them for something they said to me. If we're consciously attentive, we can say no. I'm tired of suffering. And I'm tired of making people I love suffer. So we can directly deal with that desire and conquer it. If not, we act mechanically. And we are manipulated by all these hidden, subconscious, unconscious, and infraconscious desires like puppets, like marionettes, manipulated by our own mind, by our own karma. This is the sad state of humanity. Fortunately, there is a cure. There is an answer. The answer cannot be bought. There is no magic bullet. There are no promises. The answer requires more energy and effort than you can possibly imagine. It requires your life. The price is your life. The answer is to awaken. You may recall that after the Buddha, Shakyamuni, had attained his comprehension, his enlightenment, He was approached by a Brahmin who said, are you a man? And the Buddha said, no. Are you a god? The Buddha said, no. He said, what are you? He says, I'm awake. A Buddha, an angel, a master, was once like us. Humanity itself is a womb. Humanity is a womb within the body of the Divine Mother Nature. This womb is receiving influences, forces, energies in order to gestate something, to generate something. There are two potential outcomes. Angels and demons. If you survey our current state of humanity, what would you say is the most common outcome? We're not saying that demons are what we classically imagine, or people in red suits with pitchforks. The true definition of a demon is an entity which is divorced from God, which is completely separated. In other words, which has no conscience, is able to commit extreme acts of harm and not regret it. To hurt others and to feel good about that. This is a demon in Gnostic terms. And the world is filled with them. That's because to become a demon is easy. Very easy. A demon can also awaken consciousness. A demon also can meditate. A demon also knows many sciences that are esoteric. A demon knows many things that the common man does not. The difference is that the demon remains enslaved to desire. So this womb within the Divine Mother Nature is encircled, is enwrapped by many forces acting upon it. The one we've gathered to discuss is the Zodiac. Twelve rays, twelve stellar influences which descend and provide light In other words, consciousness, elements, influences. 
Where does that light come from? Where does our own consciousness come from? In the Kabbalah, we understand that at the root, at the base of all things, is emptiness. The nothing. The ain. This nothingness is a beyond concept. But that nothingness, from within it emerges a light, which is called the Ein Sof. Ein Sof means limitless light. The Ein Sof is the being of our being, our own inner star, a drop of that vast nothingness. that drop extends itself and projects a light, a ray, which in Hebrew is called the Ein Sof Or. Or Jeff called it the ray of Okidanok. The Aztecs call it Quetzalcoatl. In Sanskrit, it's called Avalokiteshvara. In Tibetan, they call it Chinrezi. In English, we call it Christ. This light, the cosmic Christ, the light of the world, is the root of existence, the root of light, the root of life, the root of all things. It is not a person. It is an energy, a force, an intelligence. That ray, the light itself, has three aspects. In the Pisti Sophia, these are called the three amens. In Greek, they are the three logos. Logos means word or verb. We're studying astrology, astrologos. Or in other words, the word in relation to the stars in relation to the heavens. The three logos, the Trimurti, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, a trinity, a triunity of three in one, which in Hebrew are Keter, Chokmah, and Bina. These three, as one, are the cosmic Christ itself. They are God, the Father. These three are what give rise to the Kabbalistic world of Atzilut, which is the world of archetypes. These three are the root of all manifestation. They are the first manifestation. Previous to that, everything is unmanifest or a pure potentiality. When we look at these three individually, we see keter, which means the crown in Hebrew. Keter is a state of pure becoming. Think about that. As this energy unfolds and emanates out of the nothingness, the first manifestation is a state of pure becoming. From this, you may begin to grasp why the third state of consciousness is the doorway. Because that third state of active, attentive awareness is a state of pure becoming when we perfect it. It is that means through which we can receive the influences and guidance of God. This is the doorway to the vertical line. The line of being. Being is a verb. It is active. It is present. To be or not. It was a very esoteric statement. Shakespeare was, of course, an initiate 
who knew Gnosis. To be or not to be. To be asleep or to be awake. When one learns how to be, to be present, to be attentive, to abandon the stale process of thinking, to abandon the identification with subjective emotion, to abandon the enslavement of sensations. One can be. Therein lies peace, knowledge, understanding. Through the doorway of the third state, when we become actively attentive and aware, our own inner God then has a direct connection to assist us. That connection is multifaceted, but it has as its primary venue what Descartes called the seat of the soul, the pineal gland, which is in the center of the brain. The pineal gland is in charge of our endocrine system. It is that mysterious and beautiful leader which manages our metabolism, which manages melatonin, manages our process of sleep. This is key. The pineal gland manages the sleep of our physical body. It produces drowsiness. Not only that, the pineal gland is made of the same tissue as your eyes. The pineal gland is the third eye. The pineal gland is the root of clairvoyance. It is the gland which is activated in meditation. And when you close your eyes and see darkness now, when the pineal gland becomes active and inflamed with the fire of the Holy Spirit, with the fire of Christ, you close your eyes and you see light. You see the superior aspects of all things. The pineal gland is governed by Aries, is influenced by Aries. The symbol of Aries is, of course, the ram. A ram is a male sheep who has not been castrated, meaning that a ram has all of his masculine forces intact. He is virile. He is dominant. He is strong. And of course, the ram figures significantly in most of our world religions. Why? Why is Christ called the Lamb of God? Why is the blood of the Lamb so significant in Christian mythology? Aries is the sign of fire, one of them. It is a sign of strong, positive, aggressive, masculine forces. When we're in the, hu- the, the womb of nature, when our spark of essence enters into manifestation into a body. We receive this influence of Aries amongst the other 11. What occurs is that our own being, our own inner God, the deepest levels, the Ein Sof, projects from itself another level, which we call the spirit. This is the second triangle in the tree of life. Chesed, Gebra, and Tiferet. This is what we call the monad, which means unity. The monad is our own spirit, which has three aspects. But that monad also emits from itself another triangle, which is our soul. 
the human soul, which is made up of Netzah, Hod, and Yasod, this lower triangle on the tree of life. Emerging from that triangle is our own physical body, which is symbolized here by Malkuth, the lowest sphere on the tree of life. The spark of consciousness that we have is like a baby. It has evolved, it has grown through countless manifestations in lower forms of matter, evolving up through the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms. And through each level, gathering influences, understanding, and guidance, and becoming gradually more sophisticated evolving from a simple mineral to a plant to more sophisticated forms of plants into animals up to more sophisticated forms of animals until finally, having become sophisticated enough, it enters into the human kingdom, which is, of course, the most beautiful creation of nature, this physical organism, which is so incredibly sophisticated. We have a scant notion of what lies within it. That essence, the consciousness, revolves. It maintains itself. It is an energy, which, as you know, cannot be destroyed. That energy simply takes new bodies, one after another, for a specified period of time, according to a cycle of evolution. Through those bodies, successively, that conscious spark is receiving influences from nature. According to the esoteric doctrine of Buddhism, we have the teaching of the Buddha's necklace. And this teaching of the Buddha's necklace demonstrates how what we see symbolized in some uh, wheels of samsara by uh, not the most centermost reel, but just outside of it, you see a cycle of human bodies evolving up and down. The number 108 signifies the number of existences each essence is allotted in the human kingdom, the humanoid kingdom, rather. We have, in other words, 108 opportunities to gather Gnosis, to gather knowledge, to perfect ourselves. Those 108 lives are equivalent to nine existences in each of the 12 signs. In other words, our consciousness passes through each sign of the zodiac in its progression, in its development. We have within ourselves those influences, the elements, the, in, the knowledge, the potentialities. To look at this from another angle, we can see how the tree of life is related to the four worlds of Kabbalah. And as our essence descends through each of those successive worlds or successive trees, we are also receiving influences. Firstly, from our own ray. The Ain Sof gives rise to that first becoming of Keter Hokmah Binah. That ray, that three, is modified by the law of seven. The seven spirits before the throne. The seven archangels. Those seven permeate our consciousness with influences potentialities. And these are the seven virtues of the soul. Humility, chastity, love, temperance, happiness for others. These potentialities for virtues are placed there by the cosmic intelligences which manage those seven rays. They do this through dot, the hidden sphere. 
through a creative process related to the throat. If you analyze this tree and you place it over the human organism from top to bottom, that, the hidden sphere, or in other words, the tree of knowledge from the Bible, is exactly at the throat. So when God creates, he says, let there be light. This is through the throat, through the verb, through the logos, the sacred word. When those forces of the seven are placed into that essence, it descends further and receives influences from the twelve, the macrocosmic zodiac, or that stellar zodiac that we observe in the sky. Every one of those suns has within it an intelligence. Everything in nature is intelligent. Every atom, likewise, every planet has an anima mundi, a spirit, a soul, an intelligence. In other words, you could say that the suns, the planets, are the bodies of angels and archangels, cosmo creators. That essence, which in its development learned how to create mineral bodies, plant bodies, animal bodies, humanoid bodies, perfected itself, began to make more sophisticated forms of life like planets, like suns. This is why the Christ is called the sun, the light of the world, the solar light, because the sun itself is a vehicle of that Christic force. So as the essence descends through these four worlds to finally enter into manifestation, it's receiving all these potentialities, gifts, virtues from the gods. This is why in the Pistis Sophia, the Christ speaking through Jesus says as much. He says, For this cause have I chosen you verily from the beginning through the first mystery. The first mystery is Keter the first arcanum. So he says, Rejoice then and exult, for when I set out for the world, I brought from the beginning with me twelve powers, as I have told you from the beginning, which I have taken from the twelve saviors of the treasury of the light, according to the command of the first mystery. The twelve saviors are twelve masters, angels, gods, Devas, Buddhas, who are human beings who have elevated themselves to the degree of sophistication and wisdom that they are in charge of a zodiacal sign. And it is their duty to deliver the influence of that force to all the creatures who exist in all the inferior levels and to guide them, to assist them. Those are the twelve saviors who deliver unto the Christ the twelve powers. The twelve powers are those virtues. Related to Aries, there are certain virtues, certain capacities, which we receive. And in particular, it is the, the potential for penance, or the gifts that penance can deliver unto the soul. This is the capacity to withstand suffering and to transform that and make it into something beautiful the way the great saints and martyrs have always done. This is coming through Aries, this virile force of the Lamb, the Christ, whose very essence is sacrifice. Do you follow that? If the Lamb, the Christ, his existence is determined by love, by sacrifice. Through Ares, he gives us the gift of penance, the ability to suffer, but to suffer with virtue, to suffer with humility, to suffer with strength. In reality, there are four conditions to become a magician. When we say magician, we're talking about the real meaning of the word which comes from magi, 
which means priest. To become a priest, to become a magician, there are four conditions. You have to know how to suffer. This comes from Aries. You have to know how to be silent. You have to know how to abstain. And you have to know how to die. Those are the four conditions. Elephas Levi laid those out, and they are true. But they have esoteric meaning. It doesn't mean physical death. It's referring to the death of the ego, the death of the psyche, all the animal elements that condition us and cause suffering. Jesus continues, These twelve powers I cast into the womb of your mothers when I came into the world, that is, those which are in your bodies today. For these powers have been given unto you before the whole world, because ye are they who will save the whole world, that ye may be able to endure the threat of the rulers of the world and the pains of the world and its dangers and all its persecutions. This is why Aries is first. These gifts of the twelve powers, or these potential virtues, begin with Aries, the capacity to withstand persecution to withstand criticism, to withstand attacks, to be true to oneself, to one's being. For many times I have said unto you that I have brought the power in you out of the twelve saviors who are in the treasury of the light. These twelve saviors assist humanity by giving these virtues, gifting them unto the essence and by providing assistance and guidance to all the souls who seek the light. This means that any person who sincerely, honestly, wants to change, wants to escape suffering, wants to make a difference, can appeal to those 12 saviors, can ask for help can beg for assistance. This is where we arrive to the true nature of this course, which really should not be called astrology. It should be called astrotheurgy. Theurgy is derived from a Greek term, which refers to a form of activity or action whereby you appeal to to the gods. It's a kind of magic. But it is opposed by black magic. Real theurgy, the power of the theurgist, theos, which means God, our own inner God. When a Gnostic practitioner wishes to receive help to have guidance, to have assistance from those divine forces. There are hundreds of practices that he or she can use to meditate, to use mantra, to ask, to pray, to beg for help. But what's different is that these practices result in direct experience. These practices will place you, if you are a sincere and disciplined practitioner face to face with these divinities. Not an imaginary experience, but a real one. They give you the capacity of the doorway to become face to face with an angel, with a master, with a guide. That is the purpose of religion to unite with God to converse with God, to talk with God. But we're talking about God as the multiple perfect unity, that intelligence or energy which illuminates all his limbs, all his arms, all his hands, which are the angels, the masters, the Buddhas, the gods. Through astrotheurgy, we can walk through this door of the third state of consciousness, which is a prerequisite. 
You can never have this kind of experience if you remain asleep. Because even if you're being, if you're God, out of compassion, or some master, or Jesus himself, out of compassion, grants unto you an experience, physical or internal, and you're asleep, you'll forget. The same way you forget your dreams. The same way you don't remember what happened last week, or the week before that, or last month, or last year. We have to develop the consciousness to receive those experiences and keep them, to take advantage of them, to benefit from them. In other words, nothing is given to us for free. We can all have these types of experiences. They are our natural birthright. That is why religion, that is why guides exist, to help, to provide assistance. But they cannot help us if we don't help ourselves. It's impossible. That's why the Buddha emphasized that he could not save anyone. People always asked him, can you save me? Can you save my father? Can you save my mother? Can you save my child? He always said, no. You have to save yourself. And Jesus said the same thing. Jesus continues, For which cause I have said unto you, indeed, from the beginning, that ye are not of this world. I also am not of it. For all men who are in the world have gotten their souls out of the power of the rulers of the eons. But the power which is in you is from me. Your souls belong to the height. I have brought twelve powers of the twelve saviors of the treasury of the light, taking them out of the portion of my power, which I did first receive. These twelve powers are potentialities which we have to develop. In other words, we see, just as the zodiac exists in the macrocosmic universe and space around us, it exists within. We have that zodiac within our own universe in miniature, or the microcosm, as above, so below. We are a reflection of that, which is why the oracle of Delphi said, man, know thyself, and you will know the universe and its gods. The zodiac within is a source of light. And those 12 powers are in reality the 12 apostles. The 12 great gods of Olympus. The 12 stones in Heliopolis. The 12 aspects of the celestial Jerusalem from the book of Revelation. That celestial abode which has to be illuminated from our own works. In other terms, we say that as we awaken consciousness, we develop this capacity to be attentively aware, transforming the forces. We start to develop those apostles within us. The great misunderstanding that Christianity entered into was to take the scriptures as literal truth. There is literal truth in scripture. There's no question. But that's not why they were written. All of the ancient scriptures, all of the religious teachings were given as a form of practical guidance, practical knowledge indicating things within us. And the drama that Jesus passed through as an embodiment of the Christ, as an incarnation of the Christ, as a transmitter of that light, that drama from his immaculate conception to his resurrection and ascension is symbolic. 
the entire process, also exist in the mysteries of Mitra, Baldur, Quetzalcoatl, Buddha, all of those great teachers, Moses, Krishna. Most of them were born of a virgin. Most of them were born of the waters. There are too many similarities, even from a superficial terrestrial point of view. And the reason is they all refer to the same core teaching, the heart doctrine. The influences that we receive are placed within our consciousness and are there for us to activate and utilize as we awaken the consciousness. If we do not, those influences are polarized in the opposite way. In the same way, when we receive the influences from the seven rays, those seven spirits before the throne of God, they place within us For example, the fifth ray gives us the capacity of love as a virtue in our consciousness. This is unconditional love, Christic love. But when we're asleep and enslaved by desire, that force inverts and becomes hate, becomes anger. We then become creators of suffering, creators of karma. In the same way, the 12 powers can also be polarized. We receive the influence of our astrological sign, but we make that negative. uh, The master Samael on the Or gave a key example of Hitler. Hitler was a native of Aries. And he took that aggressive, masculine, virile force and used it in a destructive way. That capacity is within everyone to use those forces in the wrong way. Those energies, those forces, are within our three brains. They're within our body. In fact, they have a physical aspect where those forces are crystallized into our very being, our very physical existence. They are the 12 salts which exist in the world of Yasod. Yasod is related to our vital or etheric body. (coughs) Ethereal. Yasod is called the foundation. That's what that means in Hebrew. And you can see that it is the foundation of the temple. The columns of the temple rest on Yasod. Yasod is our energetic body, the body of Chi, which is a mere counterpart of the physical body. It's one aspect. These two are really one, Malkut and Yasod, from this point of view. Now, Kut is a fallen sephiroth, meaning the physical body is fallen. It's inferior in its current form. Within that energetic body are many forces and energies which give rise to all of our capacities. Without the vital body, the physical body would be dead. It has four primary aspects which deliver unto us the capacities of perception, Memory, imagination, metabolism, all the chemical processes, but most importantly, the sexual energy. And again, if you take this tree and you hold it over the physical body of a person, Yasod sits on the sexual organs. Malkut is related to the feet and legs. So Yasod points exactly at the sexual energy. And it's there that these 12 salts are deposited. 12 salts. Interesting, isn't it? These 12 salts are vital for the existence of life. If you study biology, you know what I mean. 
What's interesting is if you compare this to the Greek Olympians, the labors of Hercules, the months of the year, the hours of the day, all 12. But it's here in this number, this 12 in Yasod, that we find a great key. Because within the sexual forces are the very creative forces of God. The human being has the ability to create because of sexual energy. That is the capacity to produce life. We have no greater power, no greater responsibility. But unfortunately, we treat it like a game. We do not respect it. In ancient times, sex was highly sacred. Marriage was highly respected. It was considered a holy and spiritual union, something very profound. And the priests were the ones who provided guidance to the couples. Not merely to be there and say, okay, now you're man and wife, you can go off and do whatever you want. It wasn't that way. The priests, the guides, who in ancient times were awakened, were able to provide the guidance to those couples so they knew how to utilize those salts in order to refine the forces and energies of the consciousness itself. Now here we find a very interesting connection. The pineal gland, which is within our brain, rules over our endocrine system. And this endocrine system is the energy of the sex. It's the sexual forces, hormones. Modern doctors and biologists already recognize that when someone reaches puberty, the pineal gland begins to degenerate. Previous to that, it's very robust, very active, flooding the whole organism with hormones, with life. By the way, hormone means the force of being. So the pineal gland is there guiding the development of that new human organism through these first 12 to 14 years. But at the time puberty arrives, that human organism begins to repeat past mistakes and begins to abuse the tree of knowledge, sexuality. And those forces start to drain out, to be thrown out of the human organism. The result is the pineal gland atrophies. The imagination of that child begins to disappear. The child becomes conflicted emotionally, spiritually, mentally. The child then only seeks approval from others to have its ego fed, to have comfort in the acceptance of others. And all those capacities that the vital body formerly was able to provide through those sexual forces like imagination, like memory, like self-awareness, all go away. Every one of us can recall how beautiful life was. Even if we had a hard time, we had moments of perception as children which were distinctly different from our moments of perception as adults. Everyone can agree on that. The reason is the child is saturated with transmuted sexual energies. The brain, the pineal gland, is saturated with hormones, with those forces which are descending from God. So we have moments of brilliant self-awareness when we're children of perceiving things that the adults can't see. The fact is, very young children are very clairvoyant. This is why they see things the adults don't. Some of it may be what we would call imaginary. Some of it's real. But the adults always say, oh, that's just your imagination. There's nothing there. And the adults squash the development of the child. 
little by little, those capacities are atrophied, they degenerate, and they are lost. From 12 to 14 onward, the pineal gland dies because all the sexual energies are drained out, wasted. This is why in all of the ancient esoteric traditions, practitioners were required to keep the sexual forces, to transmute them, to hold them in the body, to learn techniques like pranayama in order to harness those forces and make use of them. What happens then is that those forces begin to circulate, to activate, to grow the pineal gland even more, to help it develop and become mature. And you will discover that in individuals who have transmuted in the past, their pineal glands were very well developed, like Beethoven, like Mozart, great artists who knew this science and thus were able to produce from the guidance of the divine works of art that we cannot even comprehend. That is a capacity that the being has when its vessel is intact, when its vehicle, the human person, becomes a very strong and robust light bulb through which that light can be transmitted. When we look at, as an example, the Olympian gods, we find a, a little bit more interesting um, display of these 12 forces. Because if you recall, the Olympian gods, there are six males and six females. What's curious about that is that if we look at the seal of Solomon. We know that we make that seal with two triangles. But if you analyze it, this triangle actually has 12 aspects. Six projective points, which go outward, which are masculine. Six receptive points, which are receptive and feminine. And it's made by two triangles which unify. Now this symbol is universal. If you go to India, you'll see it everywhere. If you go to China, you'll see it everywhere. If you go to Israel, obviously, you'll see it. You'll also see it in the Native American traditions, in the Aztec traditions. You'll see it everywhere because it's universal, just like the cross. The two triangles have many levels of meaning. From our most immediate level, most important to us, we see the integration of an active or masculine triangle and we see a female feminine triangle. These two are integrated, bonded. That symbol in India represents the creative power of Shiva. In other words, how Shiva and his spouse unite to create. What's curious is that if we learn the science of Yasod, if we learn how to take advantage of these forces, sexual forces in those salts, in the vital body, in the physical body, we learn how to take this triangle of the soul. This is related to all our three brains. This is related to our processes as a psyche. We can learn how to elevate that sexual force, the asad, up to that, to learn to create like the gods through the mantra, through the verb. And when we do that, this triangle turns upward. And what do we make here? The seal of Solomon, in the center of the tree of life. That is the ancient key of that, the hidden tree of knowledge. It is the union of the spirit, the monad, and its soul. And these two become unified. 
that seal, that star, represents a polarity. It represents, on the positive side, the supreme affirmation of the light, of the consciousness. But it can also have the opposite meaning, the supreme affirmation of the ego. The reason is, this energy that circulates throughout our psyche, throughout our physical organism, throughout our vital, astral, and mental organisms, can also be used in the wrong way. So that unification of forces, male and female, can also happen in the wrong way. Where those forces, those energies, are harnessed, but in order to serve and feed desire. In Sanskrit, in the Eastern traditions, we call this Black Tantra. This is a form of practice whereby the forces of the human organism are utilized in order to fortify desire, to fortify lust and pride and anger and fear. In other words, that is the way to create a demon. Sadly, the vast majority of the teachers and teachings about tantrism in the world today are teaching black tantra. And they're utilizing desire as a hook to say, you can have more sensational sexual experiences. They may say it's beautiful and lovely. They may talk about love and truth. But anyone who's teaching how to use the sexual forces at the same time desire is present and active and allowed, encouraged, is teaching black tantra. The master Jesus addressed this. He said, anyone who would come after me must first deny himself, deny desire, deny the animal. In our process of evolving, we develop a kind of mind through the lower kingdoms. It is a form of collective mind, which is very easy to see in the animals. It's also the type of mind that most humanity has. This is why we tend to move in groups, even though we don't like that. We like to think we're individuals and we do our own thing. In reality, we're just copying everybody else. In fact... We love to take someone else's opinion and defend it as if it were ours. Or to take someone else's experience and defend it as if it were ours. It's not true. We do it. But that collective mind is a mind that was developed in the animal kingdom, which behaved as an animal, acted as an animal, and continues to do so. This is why we see humanity now being animal. Most of our television and movies are encouraging animal behavior. Be lustful, be aggressive, be cruel. Very rare do you see anything that promotes a real virtue, to develop a real virtue. Very rare. And usually the ones that do are squashed and rejected and made fun of. To develop a real creation within the womb of humanity requires birth. Jesus said we have to be born again. And that which is flesh is flesh, born of flesh. But that which is spirit, born of spirit, is the soul. He also said, we don't have soul. He said, with patience, you will have it. The harnessing of those sexual forces begin or initiate the process of creating the soul or superior vehicles, the solar astral body, the solar mental body, the solar causal body, the Merkaba, the chariot. Those three 
four figures that were in the fire in the book of Daniel. To create the soul is a work of art that the being orchestrates through the consciousness. This is done through all these laws that we've discussed. The first law, the third, the seventh, the twelfth. All those forces conjoined and harnessed by conscious will. By will over desire. By will over fear. Will over lust. Will over pride. Will under the service of God. This is the meaning of the word telema. It comes from thy will be done. The will of God. On earth, this physical body, as in heaven. Not my will, as Jesus said, but yours. To follow that guidance. To receive the instructions of how to create the soul. How to exit the womb of humanity as something more than just an animal. To do that requires that we take advantage of all those forces. Whatever sign we have, whatever astrological influences, we have to master that. To say, well, I can't help it, it's my sign, is an excuse. What creates problems between people is not the sign, it's the ego. And in fact, any uh, common astrologer nowadays is really just a follower of the doctrine of the I. Someone who's stuffing themselves with a lot of theories, a lot of books, a lot of ideas, but who's never really experienced those intelligent forces which manage the energies of the zodiac, which guide them. The fact remains that if you awaken consciousness... You can negotiate your karma. You can get help from those stellar influences. Karma is not a blind mechanical thing. It's conscious. It's guided. So to say, well, as as this sign, we're not compatible with this other sign, there is a little bit of truth in it simply because each sign provides a certain influence could be fire or water or air or earth. But in reality, the main influence is the use of the consciousness. If we're asleep, then we're mechanically thrown around by those forces, karmic forces that exist within us. If we learn how to activate and utilize the third state to become conscious, to develop the ability to negotiate directly to ask for help from these intelligences, we can negotiate our karma. We can change the course of our life. We can enter into this vertical path which leads to greater comprehension of the being. That capacity is entirely up to us, that experience. To do that, we have to be born in the womb of our Divine Mother. That birth is real. It's not because we believe something. Nothing in the world is born because of a belief. Everything that's born is born of sex. Everything from the simplest microbe to the planets themselves, to solar systems, a nebula is simply that. It's a womb a conjunction of sexual forces on that level. Therefore, the soul itself also has to be born within the womb of our own Divine Mother. And this is that symbol, the universal symbol of the Divine Mother with the Christ child in her hands. That's not just in Christianity. The Egyptians have the same symbol. The Greeks, the Romans, all of them. Even in the East, you see the Divine Mother cradling the birth of the Christ, giving birth to that child. What's even more curious is that in Christian churches and in uh, Mediterranean 
artifacts, you find images that demonstrate and show the Divine Mother with the child surrounded by 12 people. And those are those 12 powers which are there to give influence and assistance to worship, to assist the growth of that Christ, which was born inside the heart of the human being. When the child of Christ is born in our heart, it begins to live out that drama of Jesus in us. To begin to grow, to develop, to assist us to become free. This is what, how that Christ saves us, teaching us about ourselves, assisting us in our process inside. In other words, this is what we call a bodhisattva. Bodhi means wisdom. Same as hokmah, wisdom. That Christ is born into the heart, into tifret of that initiate. Begins to grow and develop little by little as a process of understanding, a process of comprehension, a process of awakening. Eventually, when that Christ becomes mature, he calls his apostles. Those apostles are, of course, within. They are symbolic. If you read the Peace of Sophia, you're reading a treatise of initiatic wisdom, which is explaining certain levels of the process of initiation, which are quite elevated. That's why it's difficult for us to understand. But those 12 apostles are within us. We have our own Matthew, our own Mark, our own Judas inside. Those masters, those 12, exist in reality as well. But our most important focus, the main thing we need to know, is what's inside of us. It doesn't really make a difference what's outside if we don't change. Those 12 saviors are there in our own consciousness. They are parts of our own being which can provide wisdom and guidance to us. And each one has its function. Each one has its gifts that it can impart. In order to receive that, we have to awaken. We have to take advantage of all the forces that are being provided to us. Some say that times are too difficult, that karma is too heavy. They want an easy path. In reality, right now we have an unbelievable opportunity to awaken. All of the energy and force that is flooding this planet, creating so much upset, is actually energy that we can harness and utilize. When we entered into the Aquarian era and society went into upheaval, that energy is being provided as assistance for humanity. Unfortunately, what happens is, because everyone's asleep, they're using that energy in the wrong way. So instead of wanting to awaken the consciousness by freeing themselves of the ego. They're trying to awaken the consciousness by enslaving themselves to the ego. And thus we see a lot of abuse, a lot of problems, a lot of suffering. Aries governs the head, the utmost part of our organism. And within this region, we have many glands, many physical parts of ourselves that we need. The pineal gland, of course, is central. When we sit within the pineal gland to observe, to remember ourselves, we activate it. We can harness those forces of Aries, that gift, in order to awaken. That gift comes in the form of fire, divine fire fire of conscious assistance. If we misuse it, then we misuse those forces of Aries and become aggressive. We quarrel, we fight, we have problems. And you see this in the natives of Aries who have an extra dose of that influence. They tend to fight. They have great courage, great energy, but can go in the wrong direction 
and fight and fight and fight for the wrong thing. The forces of Aries are the forces of the ram, of the lamb, fire. And that force can help us or it can hurt us depending on our will. Do you have any questions? Yes. What's, what's the fourth level of the... Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> the, third, the third level of consciousness is what we call self-remembering or continuous consciousness. And this is what any initiate of any tradition is trying to develop and perfect. This is developed and perfected by the transmutation of energies and by the direction of those energies through meditation. When that continuous consciousness begins to crystallize, when the consciousness is awakening, there is a degree of development that the initiate can approach which is called a Turiya. It's a very advanced level. Uh, in some terms, it can be called nous, in the same way I mentioned the atomus, but this would be the perfection of that. So we have to understand that there is a distinction. That degree of consciousness is possessed by Buddha, by Krishna, by Jesus. Very elevated masters who've accomplished incredible works upon themselves to awaken the consciousness to that degree. That type of perception, that type of consciousness, can see many levels of life at the same time without obscuration, without subjectivity. Approaching that, we're coming up through these lower levels. So we're constantly being conditioned and, and uh, filtered by subjective levels of perception. Even if you awaken consciousness in a dream, you may only be seeing subjective things. In other words, projections of your own mind. Just because you awaken in a dream does not mean you are objectively awake. That's another thing. And that takes a lot of discipline. A lot of work. Little by little, objective consciousness starts to become one's reality. And when that is perfected, one has reached that level, the fourth level. Even then, there are levels. Even then, there's work to do. Don't think that just because someone has achieved self-realization that they're finished. They're not. There are levels and levels and levels. This line of being goes very high and it also goes very low. Unfortunately, most people are descending upon it, going deeper into sleep, deeper into animal behaviors, deeper into destruction. Yes? I mean, so if you look at the consciousness of the planet, I think it looks like or it's always been growing. I think consciousness has a pull to the light. I mean, if you just look at going from even you know, going into Homo sapiens, Well, that's according to a certain perception that we have nowadays. The, the idea that humanity is evolving on an upward arch is a theory. There may be certain evidence to support that. And what's often quoted is our technological development, right? Or the, the sophistication of our culture. We often take that as an example. But when we look at the bigger picture, particularly if we examine the doctrine of the heart and what's taught in the esoteric doctrines. We see actually the humanity is at the lowest level of development of this current age. We're in the Kali Yuga, which is the Dark Age, the Iron Age. One easy comparison we can make, if you have an artistic sensibility, compare the works of our contemporary civilization with the works of the Greeks works of the Egyptians, the works of the ancient Chinese, the works of the ancient Mesoamericans. There's a striking contrast. You see great beauty in those works. Tremendous beauty. Awesome, unimaginable beauty. But what do you see in our modern cities? 
pollution. Decaying structures, people living in abysmal conditions. This is a fact. So it doesn't answer everything. But in the esoteric doctrine, in the secret doctrine, it's actually posited that we're in the darkest of times. The process of awakening the consciousness reveals that. You start to see things that our current conditioning block. This is a key factor as well. The current, the organism that we're inhabiting now, this physical body, has been carrying our consciousness for a given number of years within a certain environment. That environment is a conjunction of conditioning forces or factors which are applied to the consciousness by our karma, by our environment, by factors such as that. That conditioning is what pushes us to sleep, to dream, to dream about the kind of possessions that we might one day have, to dream about the kind of admiration that we want, the envy of others that we want. Whatever our particular goals are, whatever our particular conditioning is, it's generally to keep us asleep, whereby we won't perceive what's really going on in the world, what's really going on in our lives. Sometimes you find this. Some of us have a conscience that becomes stimulated by the suffering, by all the problems. We want to do something about it. But it's very easy in our current state to become overwhelmed, to become traumatized when we start to see the vast sophistication of all the problems we face as a society and as a world. So oftentimes, people who have the intention to help become traumatized, become shocked, become, they abandon that. They may even start to contribute to the problem unknowingly. And it's because the, all of these issues that we face are so complicated, so interrelated, that our little intellect, this little bucket that we have, can't contain it all. And you see that trauma a lot nowadays. The way to solve it is to awaken consciousness. Each person is the society itself. Each person is connected to every other person. No one is independent. We are all dependent on one another for everything. Everything that you're wearing right now was produced by someone else. Everything that you're eating was produced by someone else, pretty much. Not many of us grow all our own food and make all our own food. But we forget that interdependence when it comes to the mind, when it comes to our feelings, to our actions. We can provoke tremendous change by being honest by being sincere, by trying to change ourselves, by coming to know God inside. You can see that in some individuals who remain true to that, like Gandhi, like Yogananda, like Jesus. Even some that never awakened consciousness but remain true to an inner ideal, an inner purpose, which is sincere and truthful. And they've managed to render change for the benefit of others. We all have that capacity. So I guess what I'm saying in synthesis is, it doesn't really matter so much what our historical perspective is. What matters is how we perceive right now. What's past is gone. It doesn't exist. And there is no future. That's an idea. What exists is right now. And that's the door. That door is inside your own heart. It's in your pineal gland. It 
It's in your psyche. It's in your consciousness. To stay focused and standing in that door takes so much willpower and discipline. It is the greatest work any person can ever undertake. Not only the most difficult, the most terrifying, the most risky. It's also the most rewarding. The process of awakening the consciousness, receiving the influences of our own inner being, is the gateway, the door to serenity, to the experience of a tranquil heart, to comprehension of the nature of reality. And again, that doesn't come easily. It doesn't come one day to the next. A question? How can we harness the new Aquarian energies pounding the earth now? Are there any practical exercises? Well, we're going to talk about that in the lecture about Aquarius. But yes, there are. There are many practices and techniques that we can use in relation to each sign. There are several related to Aries. I'll give you one simple one. When you have some time to relax, to abandon all your worries and concerns, and probably you're going to have to make that time to decide you're going to do it, sit down and relax yourself very well. Close your eyes. Begin to imagine the light. Imagine the forces of Aries, the light descending from above, illuminating your brain, flooding the pineal gland and the pituitary gland with light, with fire. And chant to yourself. You can do it aloud. It's even better. The mantra, Aum. A-U-M. Three letters. And extend the vowels. It's very good if you vocalize this because that vibration produced by your throat will affect the brain, the pineal gland, the pituitary gland, and the rest of the organism. (coughs) Do that practice every day. Don't think. Just do it. Take a period of time and work with it. Open your mind. Open your heart. And pray. And imagine that force and vocalize the mantra. Be serious. What are you doing with your life? What is the purpose of your life? To merely exist? To go from one form of suffering to another until death? What's the point of that? Most people live that way. Scrabbling to get one material possession after another or one worldly honor after another only to be stabbed in the back, only to be betrayed, only to be disappointed. Talk to any older person, you'll find that. Take advantage of this moment. Train your consciousness to awaken. This is how we take advantage of all these forces and to begin to develop the 12 superior senses. The 12 senses, rather. We have the five physical ones, which we know, or how we interface with this physical world. There are seven superior senses related to our seven chakras. Those are the 12 fruits of the tree of life, which Revelation says, he who overcomes can consume, can eat those fruits, the 12 fruits of the tree of life. Also in Revelation, there is a woman who stands upon the moon clothed with the sun who has 12 stars circling her head as a crown. Right? We have this crown. Keter. That crown of those 12 powers which are developed in the fully developed soul who wears the sun, the Christ, as her vesture and who trods upon the moon, the forces 
of the animal, the lunar forces. Next question. When one is perceiving subjectively in the astral plane, does someone with an objectively awakened consciousness perceive the same thing, projection? Well, if your question is that, say you're in the astral plane and some angel or master comes to visit you, you're there dreaming, seeing your subjective world, yes, that angel will see that like a bubble, like a, a mirage, and see you sleeping inside of it. You can develop the capacity to see that as well with the help of your being, the help of God. To have objective perception is possible for anyone as a matter of willpower. This is not a matter of time. Time is an illusion. The only thing that exists is right now. If you have sufficient will, you can walk right through this door of the present moment, conscious, into superior levels of perception and see objective truths. In other words, you can enter into samadhi, which is a perception of truth without the interference of the ego. Anyone can do that. The problem is you need to have sufficient will. And as we are, all of our will is trapped in desire. So instead, we desire that experience. We crave it. Right there, you're blocked. You cannot have it. Because that desire is conditioning your consciousness and trapping you in that level. Yes? That's why it's so easy to imagine about, like in one second, you can elaborate this big imagination about some kind of desire you have because you have so much willpower trapped in that type of desire. Precisely. We have so much will and desire. It's very easy to imagine desires. Very easy. But to imagine something consciously without desire, we become so frustrated because we haven't developed that capacity. The consciousness, the free consciousness is weak, like a baby. When we're born into a physical body, we have this very scant development of the consciousness because in all our previous lives, we've ignored it. Or worse, we've betrayed it. So we've trapped it into all these subjective constructions in our own mind. So when we're born, that ego is not there yet. It's just the consciousness. That's why babies are so beautiful. That's just the consciousness there. But it's very simple. It's not developed. Little by little, as the karma incorporates, the ego incorporates, the baby starts to demonstrate really negative behaviors. And that's all its own karma. We have within us that same child, our own consciousness, that has to be grown. So now when we meditate and we imagine, it's very difficult to imagine something free of desire, free of ego. But we can do it. We just have to be patient. Nothing in nature grows by leaps. The consciousness is the same. It takes patience, tenacity, and work. Now you have to Keep that in mind at the same time that I say time is not a factor. It's not. The factor is will. The factor is keeping the consciousness active and aware, working. That's what grows it, not time. You can study this doctrine for 10 years, for 30, for several lifetimes, and never awaken. You can study this doctrine for a couple of months, a couple of days, a couple of hours, and awaken. And that's entirely up to your use of your own consciousness inside, not to anyone else. No master can come along and awaken you. No teacher can do it. Only you. Do you have another one? So then, regardless of what sign you are, Aries is one of the most important influences for all of us all the time, or mainly during that sign in the calendar. Well, that's a good question. All the signs are important to everyone, yes. But of course, during the, during the process of the year, as everything's moving, the signs have a particular influence, stronger. 
So we go through these periods of time where Aries is stronger, more influential. And there are exercises, like the one I gave you, to harness that force, to take advantage of that extra energy. And it's true for each sign. And we're going to study that over the next few weeks. Each sign will study that individual you know, influence and, and some exercises we can use to take advantage of them. In addition, our own birth sign, the sign we were born under, also provides an additional influence. But typically, with us, it's negative. We have to convert that into something positive. Same way as with the periodic, ele- the periodic influence and the one that's continual in us all the time. Another question? Anyone else? Okay, thank you. See you next week. Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.